Oh, hello there. I'm just polishing up the pyramids for our next trip. For chapter six, we'll be going to Teotihuacan in Mexico, and from there to Tikal in Guatemala, the realm of the Mayans. Stay with us, won't you? We first saw this chart of retrieved constants back in chapter 3. Both Giza and Stonehenge provided and explained them. In this chapter we will find that they were also very well known in the West, for example. Here they are, all mixed up. The 360 degree base system, alternate pi, pi and double pi the square root of the volume of the 360 degree sphere, the radian, two-thirds pi, the square of the megalithic yard, the double radian, the two, fifteen and sixty from Stonehenge, and even the square root of 2160. Why do they come to focus on 15.4919-3338? The prehistoric city of Teotihuacan in Mexico all of it. Buildings, plazas, terraced platforms, streets, and even its pyramids, everything laid out on an exact azimuth of 15.49193 degrees. Teotihuacan, the city of mystery. Despite decades of on-site investigations, archaeologists know virtually nothing about it. Who built it? When? Why? Zero. Even the Aztecs had no answers for the place. When they came into Mexico, Teotihuacan, which they named the City of the Gods, was already abandoned and in ruins, centuries before the white man ever saw it. Even its name was lost in time. Its largest pyramid is this one, the Pyramid of the Sun. Its original corner is lost in decay. Its original baseline measurement is unknown to archaeologists. Further, some 25 to 30 feet of its outer veneer was removed in the early part of the 20th century when an archaeologist sought to find a better defined interior, which he did. That's the Sun Pyramid we see today, about 730 feet square. But Hugh Harleston went after its original footing in order to find a better picture of its original state. He found that the sun was once some 750.8 feet square at its base, said position being 7,508 feet above sea level today, another base 10 reference, and in feet. If this was its baseline length, then the sun's base was only a few feet shorter than that of Giza's Great Pyramid. But being only half as high and terraced, it has never received the attention it so richly deserves. That will change in the next few minutes. First, the equation which finds Teotihuacan in their matrix clearly specifies that it was a very important site far more important than anyone had ever realized. Well, hang on to your socks. The silence of Teotihuacan is about to end. Remember the Juliaco Pyramid, about a day's walk from Teotihuacan? Four terraces became four pi in its decoding. Five terraces here on the sun, right? Yes, but we must be very careful when eyeing the sun. For example, notice that its fourth terrace 
was designed to show two separate slope angles. Hence, while the sun actually has five terraces, it likewise has six separate faces. That's five pi and six pi. Then, too, we have this. Seen in its side elevation, as drawn by the University of Rochester following its 1973 site survey, Dr. Druitt of the University of Toronto was kind enough to send this along. Notice that the upper terraces of the sun were deliberately built off-center. Working as I have with this matrix system since 1982, I have found that matrix coordinates always bear on the center of a monument's base, not its summit. Accordingly, the lower two faces are distinctly separate from the upper four. That's 2 pi and 4 pi. In all, then, we have 2 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, and 6 pi, speaking from the Sun Pyramid. These present a simple pi multiplex. Resulting in the value of 23,378.1818.4, a number which exactly encodes the Sun's latitude upon the Earth. Nineteen degrees, forty-one minutes, and thirty point oh one oh five seconds north. Dead center on the pyramid. Notice, dead center on the pyramid, not on its summit. And the sun finally speaks. I am a pi multiplex, and I will show anyone why I am where I am, if they know my language. As for the matrix proper, the sun addresses it, from its grid latitude of 23378.181814, the access key is, of course, pi. Divide it by pi itself, and we find the 7441.506 square foot area of Stonehenge. Or we can divide it by double pi and get this. The grid latitude of another major pyramid of the matrix, one whose grid longitude we already know. Temple 4 at Tikal in Guatemala. The Temple of the Double-Headed Serpent, its frontal elevation. And its side elevation. The Sun shows us many multiples of the pi ratio. We could even use 5 pi. To find this, the grid latitude of still another giant. That being the Cholula Pyramid, the largest pyramid on Earth in terms of volume, over 200 million cubic feet, over twice that of Egypt's Great Pyramid, despite the fact that it is less than half its height. In the matrix, then, the Sun Pyramid was one of considerable significance. It was not a temple to some ancient pagan religion, as we have been led to believe. And mapping was not the only aspect of the matrix which it relates. Using its grid latitude again, along with pi, and the azimuth of the entire city of Teotihuacan, the sun tells us this. The Great Pyramid's height, in terms of feet, and from Mexico. From its grid latitude, pi reflects the area of Stonehenge in square feet. 
This equation is the same, except that we also include the azimuth of the city. It only follows, then, that this new figure is also a unit of measurement in feet. At Stonehenge, remember its language? Its measurements hidden in its own rocks. And there's another example here at Tikal in Guatemala. An old friend by now, Temple 4, the Temple of the Double-Headed Serpent. Lord, where do they get these names from? As we recall, the grid latitude of Temple 4 was 3720.75, coming from the Sun Pyramid by way of double pi. And now that we've found where it is, notice that Temple 4 has nine terraces. Which feeds a simple equation. What does 33486.77 mean? When Tiabert Maller, the German archaeologist, cleared Tikal and obtained the field measurements of its pyramids in the 19th century, being German, he measured everything with his native metric ruler, which, of course, will never reveal anything where these monuments are concerned. But when we convert them over to British 12-inch feet, we find that Temple 4 has a base area of 33,486 square feet. Should anyone care to challenge me on this, his work was saved in the Peabody Museum, Harvard University Memoirs, Volume 5, Number 1. It's only a matter of time before the foolish metric system is forced upon us, thereby obsoleting and eventually erasing the 12-inch foot from thought. So thank you, Peabody. Had you not saved Maller's work, we may never have known. Look upon me. Count what I show. Then measure my base, and I will tell you why I am where I am. Digest the logic carefully. It works either way. We can also work from its grid latitude, multiply by the nine terraces and find its base area. It's how they hid actual measurements. No real trick to it. Do not be intimidated by their genius. These ancient masters were smart, damn smart. But they were only human. And anything a human can encode, another human can decode. Exercise patience. Great teachers are speaking to us from this matrix. But we've been to the moon, so don't underestimate the student over here on our side of time. We too can learn new languages. While the ancients certainly handled their math differently than we do, their use of our modern 12-inch foot can be found everywhere at Tikal, and even our 5,280-foot mile. And one of the best classrooms in which to study it is right here at Tikal, which I suspect was the Matrix University itself. Temple 2, shown here, was its smallest pyramid, only 142 feet high. Remember the recent television commercial for athletic footwear, wherein they showed a pair of kids running up the staircase of a Mayan pyramid? This was the pyramid. And it only has 49 steps. They should try out in Temple 4 sometime. That'll make a wreck out of any athlete. 49 steps to the top of the pyramid proper here at Temple 2, the so-called Temple of the Masks. Then notice that from there up to the doorway of the Temple proper are 10 additional steps. That's 59 in all, divided into two distinctly separate staircases. When 59 is divided by 2, the result is 29 and a half. Notice that the base of the staircase at ground level 
is 29 and one half feet wide. That's feet. Of course, this too is converted from Mahler's metric determination. The 12 inch foot explained on the facade of Temple 2. Temple 2 faces a larger pyramid across a plaza, Temple 1. The Temple of the Giant Jaguar, colorful names. Temple 2, Temple 3, and Temple 4, which is just off the map to the west, all face east toward the sunrise. Sunrise worship, don't you know? But what about Temple 1? Why does it face west? Sunset worship? It's easy to see how the experts in primitive religions might draw such simplistic conclusions, but that's not at all why Temple One faces west. They miss this one by a country mile. When Mallor measured the temple atop Pyramid Number One, he found it to have a depth of, and I quote, exactly 759 centimeters. Exactly, eh? Well, it's hard to call anything much closer than exactly. Converting his 759 centimeters over to feet, it becomes exactly 24.9015 British feet. 24915. 24,901.5 statute miles is the equatorial circumference of the earth as we know it today. Why does Temple One show us the distance around the world? Around the world. There are several dozen ways of pulling Temple One's coordinates from the matrix, but I'll cut through all that and get right down to the heart of it. Temple One's longitude is 120 degrees, 45 minutes, 22.9183 seconds west of Giza. And to the east of Giza, the long way around the world across Asia and the Pacifics, it is 239 degrees, 14 minutes, 36.98 seconds. Notice that its actual longitude in either direction presents exactly the same grid longitude. Temple of the Giant Jaguar? Sorry. Temple One is the peripheral pyramid, and that's why it faces to the west. As the peripheral pyramid, it addresses the global matrix in both directions, east and west. It therefore looks around the world, like the Earth's equatorial circumference. The exact numbers of which were left for us in the depth of its lofty temple. Since 24,901.5 statute miles is made up of 5,280 foot miles, Tikal shows us still another clear reference to our modern 12 inch foot. Moving over to the west of Temple 1, we have Temple 4, by now quite familiar, via its grid latitude, nine terraces, area formula, which shows us its 33,486 square feet area. The height of its individual terraces is 15 and one half feet. Might that be 15.5? 4919 feet, the same figure used in the layout of Teotihuacan. Feet. And then we have its slope angle. As near as we are able to determine this angle, it comes back as 72.6 degrees. 72.66 is the square root of 5,280. References to our modern 12-inch foot and 5,280-foot mile are all over Tikal, but there is also something else common to its pyramids which, in my view, infers Tikal's ancient usage as a university where the matrix was taught. 
Going back a bit in this presentation, recall the actual West Giza longitude of Temple 4. The final element, seconds of longitude, was the exact radius of Stonehenge, 48.6693441 feet. This particular delivery was common, and indeed still is common, to all of Tikal's pyramids. The final element of their actual longitudes are recognizable mathematical constants. Temple 4 shows us the radius of Stonehenge. We saw this just moments ago, the two-faced longitudes of Temple 1, the peripheral pyramid. Notice that the final element of its West Giza longitude is 22.918311 seconds. 22.918311 is also exactly two-fifths of the 57.2957 radian constants in the tailings of Tikal's pyramids. And the longitude of its temple number three. 34.377467 is exactly three-fifths of the radian. This particular value, three-fifths of the radian, locates other monuments in the matrix, such as Florida's mound key, and where it is in the matrix vector. Not on the island, but on the big mound which survives there. And mounds and pyramids are not all that it finds. It likewise vectors on this. Florida's warm mineral springs, the waters of which are reputed to have certain beneficial even healing properties. Why does this figure for three-fifths of the radian shown to us so clearly by Tikal's 178-foot-high Temple 3 vector itself on warm mineral springs? There's no mounds or pyramids there, just water. Is this perhaps the fabled Fountain of Youth once sought by Ponce de Leon? There are thousands of springs in Florida, so when warm mineral springs answered the matrix, I wasn't particularly moved by it, probably just coincidence. To be sure, I ran the constants in the matrix over the coordinates of several dozen other randomly selected springs. Of the lot, only one answered. The Little Salt Spring, a few miles north of WMS. And of all the constants available in the matrix, Little Salt answered at four-fifths of the radian. Another radian fractional on a Floridian spring. What is this ancient matrix trying to tell us here? Well, we are not entirely without answers of our own. Warm Mineral and Little Salt Springs are known to rank as two of Florida's most important natural springs and we know that they've been flowing generously for many thousands of years. Human remains have been found in proximity which date back 10,000 years. But was one of these springs the fountain of youth? Only they who have benefited from its waters can answer that. I must admit that their grid vectors answering the matrix at clear fractionals of the radian caught my interest. It also caught the imaginations of Floridian spring buffs, and soon other maps showing the state's springs were flowing my way. I ran their coordinates too, but they ignored the math. Until the day when the map for Mudhole Spring arrived. Mudhole is offshore, off the west coast of Florida, under 40 feet of ocean, yet its upward flow of water is so powerful that its position is actually marked on NOAA's map of the region. The site is well known by local fishermen, too. I ran its coordinates. Mudhole Spring answered the probe at a grid vector 
of 5.72957. That's one-tenth of the radian. And we have a third major spring vectoring the matrix at a radian fractional. But fountain of youth? I don't know. But I am drawing a theory that there is something remarkable about these watering spots, something the ancient cartographers deemed important enough to encode in their pyramid matrix system. Which poses another question. These springs are very ancient. And the fact that their positions answer the pyramid matrix indicates to me that they, along with other anciently known energy sites, may have been part of the reason this matrix was devised in the first place to show geomathematically their importance to mankind, in which case the pyramid matrix may have been mapped around them. For any who might care to double-check my findings with regard to these three springs, be careful of our maps. Present-day maps are still based on the 1927 North American Datum, or NAD. On such maps, coordinates in Florida can be off by as much as 100 feet. Correct them to our 1983 NAD. These are satellite corrections, and these are the positions which this ancient matrix answers. Do radian fractionals in the matrix show us things beneficial to us, to the earth, or perhaps both? Dare we ignore such communications? The ancients clearly understood. Now it's our turn. If the ancient masters did indeed incorporate the grid points of these important Floridian spring sites into a global matrix system involving their pyramids, long before the pyramids were ever built, then there has to be a way that the positions of these pyramids or allied monuments can explain from their positions. But which monuments are we to ask? There are thousands of them here in the United States alone. If you wish to learn information about springs today, you go to an encyclopedia and look underwater. The same is true in the Pyramid Age, except their encyclopedia consisted of a mathematical language. What do we have in the matrix which answers water? How about a mound which is surrounded by water, like this one, the Shark Mound on North Bimini Island, just east of Florida? It's called a shark because it resembles a lemon shark. The shark is made entirely of sand and is only a few feet high. But it is also 500 feet long, hence is of a respectable size. It is also surrounded by water. And as it is water we are trying to understand, let's begin with this artifact. Here we have its latitude and longitude the longitude being reckoned from Greenwich and therefore quite useless. Adjusting its longitude over to the Great Pyramid, we find it to be centered at 110 degrees, 22 minutes, and 53.55 seconds, thereby providing it with a grid longitude of 129,600, or in the language of the period, a square of 360 degrees. This, along with its grid latitude, gives the shark a grid point value or vector of two-thirds of pi. And? On the map, shark locates here. On the continent proper, one of America's largest effigy earthworks is this, whatever it is, at Portsmouth, Kentucky. Yeah, what is it?
The only name it has in the formal record is Portsmouth Group A Earthworks, written in by Squire and Davis in the 1820s when they surveyed the site for the first time. Even then it was so ancient that erosion had cut several gullies across it. A 5,000 foot long what's it? The aboriginals made lots of effigy mounds in North America. Snakes, turtles, squirrels, birds, fish, you name it and they left it somewhere. But this thing. I have hiked and fished through the wilds of North America from the Catskills of New York to the White Mountains of Alaska and I can assure one and all that I have never seen anything walking, crawling, swimming, or flying that looks even remotely like this. And look, atop its central box section, it has a handle. Clearly, this effigy represents something that was anciently manufactured, perhaps a weapon of some sort. It even shows a curved indentation at its right end, as if designed to fit the shoulder of a hunter. Whatever it is, or was, this earthworks is worthy of suspicion. Why? Because it is only about 1,500 feet from a large river, the Ohio. Water again, and major water. So let's call this thing the device. Maybe one of the reasons we the people haven't heard much about it, beyond the works of Squire and Davis, is because there isn't much left of it today. Much of it is now part of Portsmouth. Buildings everywhere. But enough fragments survive to show up on a formal USGS 7.5 topographical map. So it hasn't been completely lost yet. To make a long story short, when we divide its grid latitude by its grid longitude, we find that its grid point value is exactly three. Having that, we add the device to our map. Okay, so far we have a natural effigy and a man-made effigy. It's time to involve a pyramid. And the biggest one on the entire continent is that humongous heap of dirt at Cahokia, known as Monk's Mound. 1,037 feet long, 790 wide, and 94 high. But that's as we see it today. Originally, it looked more like this, and was 100 feet high. A real monster. Half again as long as Giza's Great Pyramid. They who follow my work have already been through monks, so let's get right to its grid point value, which is 1.047, or one third of pi. Interesting. One third of pi at monks, two thirds pi at the shark, and a full three at the device. And oh yes, the water aspect, monks is on one of the ancient flood terraces of the mighty Mississippi River. Okay, we add monks to our map. Good. Two effigies in a pyramid. What shall we involve next? How about the face? No, not the one over on Mars. Ours. The mile-long face at Poverty Point. After all, faces no things. We have covered Poverty Point in the original video, so let's get right to the point. It's grid point. The eye on the face, the misnamed Motley Mound, which also resides near water. Its value in the matrix? 1.909859 or one-thirtieth of the radian, another mathematical constant. Now, when we add the eye to our map, then join the lines from major monument to major monument, and then multiply their grid point values, one-third pi, two-thirds pi, one-thirtieth of the radian, and three, 
we find the constant 4 pi, 12.56637. interesting. We moderns think of map grids being square or rectangular, not something that looks like a kite. But it is mathematically sound. Now, what do we do with it? The only common ground these artifacts have in nature is the fact that all four are near water. Maybe we need another water-bound artifact? And I can't think of a bigger one anywhere than Florida's 5,500 foot long panther mound in the Everglades. Remember it from the previous video? The mother of Giza's Sphinx? North Bimini's shark mound was completely surrounded by Atlantic Ocean. Florida's panther mound is completely surrounded by the waters of the Everglades. What we do next is to switch mounds in the kite. We will dispose of the shark mound and replace it with Florida's panther mound. The other grid points of the kite remain the same. This, of course, changes the values in the kite. We drop the shark whose grid point value was two-thirds of pi and are replacing it with a panther mound, grid point value 30 pi. This time, we divide. To find that putting the panther on the tail of the kite changes the overall value to 5 pi. Checking everything once again to protect against losing anyone's concentration. North America's largest aboriginal monuments, bar none. Another mathematical constant. Okay, so far we have 4 pi and 5 pi kite grids. But how do they serve? Maybe we can someday swing the tail of the kite eastward to 3 pi and find some sunken Atlantean pyramid, or westward to 6 pi for something the Mayans lost in the Caribbean. Maybe. But the logic being conveyed here by these ancient builders says two things to me very clearly. First, water. Remember, both the shark and the panther are surrounded by it. And two, swing the tail of the kite. But to what? How about to water itself? Something significant underwater, like perhaps an underwater spring. Like maybe the mud hole spring off Florida's west coast. Grid point value one tenth of the radian, 5.72957. The top of the kite holding its corners on the eye, monks, and the device as usual. We now drop the panther mound from the bottom and replace it with mud hole springs grid point value. Then multiply and voila. Instant recognition. The value of three fifths of the radian. And As we already know, it's the grid point of warm mineral spring in the global matrix, and found by mathematically oriented swinging kites. What else is there to say? The water mounds found major water sources, and when they wrote their final equation, the answer came out right on warm mineral springs. Now we know. The information Ponce de Leon found concerning the Fountain of Youth was valid. Problem was, he didn't know the pyramid grid system. 
which had encoded its location a hundred centuries earlier. He had no hope of finding it without resorting to actual trial and error legwork. The ancients revered War Mineral Springs so highly that they built the major monuments of North America at such grid points as could point it out to us as soon as we came to understand the mathematical precisions of the earth. Fascinating by itself, our search has also explained how a portion of their global grid actually works. I wonder what else they revered that we haven't found yet. The Matrix is still young. The search continues. Thank you. This is the ground plan of the Akapana Pyramid at Tiwanaku, Bolivia. It contains part of the message explaining why it is where it is. Some of you know how to do this. For those who do not, it's really quite simple. The Great Pyramid contains part of the wall, the mathematical pi ratio. Its slope angle from the apex downward has a tangent value which we can find with a modern pocket calculator. Multiply this tangent by the four sides of the pyramid and we find pi memorialized forever. Having been so advised, we should apply this ratio to what we see in other pyramids around the world. For example, Mexico's Pyramid of the Sun. In this side elevation, notice that the upper bodies of the monument are offset toward the rear. Count the sloped surfaces, which, as we see, have been deliberately separated two slopes in the lower body and four in the upper, two and four. From the front, the sun appears uniform in its presentation. Now we see six slopes on five terraces. That's five and six. The sun, then, presents a simple mathematical formula when we recall that the Great Pyramid at Giza tells us to apply pi. The two, four, five, and six features on the sun pyramid become two pi, four pi, five pi, and six pi. Multiplied, we find this large irrational, a single number. What does it mean? Nothing at all, unless one is careful to notice that there are three other numbers which also multiply to meet it. The numbers 19, 41, and 30.0105. In these we find unquestionable meaning because at 19 degrees, 41 minutes, and 30.0105 seconds, in the language of mapping, it is precisely where the Sun Pyramid situates on our maps. 19 degrees, 41 minutes, 30.0105 seconds north of the equator. That's not bad for the alleged savages that are supposed to have built this pyramid. Did they really know where the equator was? Two, four, five, and six. Yeah, they knew. And they also knew about the pi ratio, having been memorialized over at Giza. In fact, they knew every bit as much about global mapping as we do, if not more. The same geomathematical logic was incorporated in the Akapana Pyramid at Tiwanaku. Unfortunately, we cannot extract data from its terraces because people have been chopping away at this pyramid since the Spanish began sacking the West five centuries ago. 
It is so badly gutted today that no one knows how many terraces it had. Except me. But that's for another time. You see, while we can destroy a pyramid, we cannot destroy the mathematics which gave it form. In their immense wisdom, the builders made certain that the Acapana would never become silent. How did they manage this? By protecting its geomathematical data in its base plan. Proceed in much the same way we did at Teotihuacan's Pyramid of the Sun. Pay close attention to what we see. The emphasis here was on the 90 degree corner angle, of which there were exactly 16. 16 and 90. Then simply apply pi to the formula and find. Well, it's not as if we don't know what to expect. Sixteen degrees, thirty-three minutes, zero eight point five six seven seconds south of the equator. Even the pre-Inca knew where the equator was. The next question is, how old is Tiwanaku's Acapana? Is there a way to demonstrate its age? Possibly so. All we have to do is match its position against the oldest monument known. What might that be? The very same number that encodes the latitude of the Acapana Pyramid at Tiwanaku encodes the actual latitude of Sidonia's face north of the Martian equator. Geomathematical correlation. Now then, which came first? Sidonia's face or the Acapana Pyramid? Why is the pi ratio required for locating the Acapana? In my initial presentation, we found that England's Stonehenge provided the keys to one level of this magnificent coded system, and pi was not required. Despite its ruined condition today, British archaeologists have long since determined what Stonehenge looked like when brand new, a minimum of 3,700 years ago. It was part of an even more ancient circular earthworks, sporting a diameter of 288 feet. The inner circle, known as the Phase Three construction, with a meager diameter of only 97 feet 4 inches, consisted of 60 huge rocks, 30 horizontal lintels fitted to the tops of 30 upright rocks called sarsens. 60 stones carefully arranged in a 360 degree circle. It proposes a simple formula. 60 times 360 equals 21,600. And it was this number which encodes the latitude of Stonehenge north of the equator, because 51 degrees, 10 minutes, and 42.35 seconds just happens to be the parallel upon which Stonehenge was centered. That discovery advised us rather quickly that the builders not only knew multiplication and numbers, but also that they knew the common circle to have a 360 degrees of arc. Hence, they knew math and simple geometry as well as we do and in our terms. 
3,700 years ago. Even more surprising, the location of Stonehenge proves beyond any question that their mapping skills were at least on a par with our own. They were not the dim-minded semi-savages that contemporary history insists they were. Now knowing that the ancient Celts understood a 360 degree circle for what it was in geometric terms, we took the circle over to the Western Hemisphere. Where, at Newark, Ohio, we found that the architects of the great aboriginal earthworks were also familiar with the grid latitude of Stonehenge, a third of a world away. Here at the 1,056 foot wide observatory circle, we find 21,600 again, albeit reduced by a factor of 10. 2160, which encoded its latitude of 40 degrees, 2 minutes, 27 seconds north of the equator. Then we walked over to Newark's Great Octagon, a little over a mile to the northwest, only to find that these very same numbers were used again as 216,000, which encodes the longitude, not latitude of the huge earth circle which attaches itself to the octagon. 2160 at the observatory circle, 21,600 at Stonehenge, and 216,000 at the octagon. Proof by way of our own maps that the ancients knew and used a base 10 system as we do. Then we went on to Mexico to check out the only round pyramid ever found down there, only to discover that even its ancient people likewise knew that a circle had 360 degrees of arc. They proved that by having built this 360 degree monument right on its own grid latitude of 360, at 19 degrees 18 minutes 01.05 seconds north of the equator, the same equator that we use and the ancient British used when they erected Stonehenge. Then we have the stretched circle, the oval-shaped motley mound at Poverty Point, Louisiana, which the archaeologists misnamed because they favored digging in the ground rather than looking down from above. Had they paid any attention to our topographical maps, they would have seen that the motley was actually an eye. On a mile long human face, which was formed by the escarpment to the east side of the site. Motley was actually an eye, a 360 degree oval, on a face which looks off to the east. East means 90 degrees, and when 90 is multiplied by 360, it becomes. 32,400. The grid latitude of the eye. Then we have Mississippi's Emerald Mound with its five corners and six surfaces comprising a corrupted 360 degree form. Five times six times 360 becomes 10,800 the figure which encodes its latitude of 31 degrees, 38 minutes, 09.16 seconds north. From there we take the 360 degree logic to its square cornered form here at Dasher in Egypt about nine minutes south of Giza, we find the so-called Bent Pyramid, a monument whose slope angle changes about halfway up its face, presenting what is readily seen as two separate bodies. Egyptologists advise us that the reason for these two different slope angles was due to engineering considerations. Too much weight bearing downward would have caused the sides to buckle and the monument would have self-destructed. 
Therefore, the ancient builders decided to lower the slope angle at the halfway mark. That's more baloney than we hear in the average political campaign speech. Egyptologists are not going to want to hear this, but Seneferu's engineers knew exactly what they were doing. True, the lower slope angle at 54.7 degrees was a few degrees steeper than Giza's Great Pyramid, but it posed no risk of collapse. Angle and weight were no problem. Over at Tikal in Guatemala, the Mayans had no trouble with collapsing pyramids, and they didn't have squared block construction in their monuments. Here, pyramid interiors were rubble, and the outer veneer merely cemented field stone. The 228-foot-tall Temple 4 had a slope angle of 72.6 degrees, not 54 as on Seneferu's, and it's still there. Therefore, if there is any substance to what the Egyptologists assert as the reason for the bent pyramids being bent, then none of the Mayan pyramids should have reached us intact. This design affords an observer the opportunity to see additional numbers beyond those available from a true pyramid design. Here, instead of only four sides, we see eight. And rather than seeing four base corners and an apex, we see eight corners and an apex. That's nine. 360 degrees times eight times nine, 25,920. This figure encodes its actual latitude of 29 degrees, 47 minutes, and 19.01 seconds. It was deliberately bent in order to show anyone why it is where it is. There were no engineering problems. A second reason for breaking an otherwise perfect 360 degree base design was to reveal two bodies of 360 degrees. What happens when we divide 360 by 2? 180, of course, which answers its longitude nicely. But not its longitude from our modern Greenwich. The prime meridian of the Pyramid Age was predicated on the position of the Great Pyramid, from which the Bent Pyramid lies to the east. These pyramids are points in a remarkable global matrix which explains a global positioning system involving the mathematical precisions of the Earth. Why haven't we seen this before? Because the questions we have been asking of the pyramids are inadequate. Who built them, when, and how are irrelevant. We should have been asking why they are where they are and why they were built the way they were built and they made it so easy for us. We have even known the measurements of the Bent Pyramid for some time. But since we do not understand the language of the age, we can't read the figures. The height of the lower body, for example, 160.996 feet, is the square root of 25 920. It's grid latitude. Another classic example of this simplicity is found in Mexico at the well-known Chichen Itza site, home of the celebrated Kukulkan Pyramid, long famous for its 365 steps. 91 on each of its four sides, with the top of the pyramid being the 365th step. Historians see it all as artistic excess on behalf of the builders, but that is erroneous. They built only what was necessary. Study Kukulkan from above. What do we see? Do we not see a four-sided pyramid with four staircases, nine terraces, and 365 steps. 
Basically, that's all we need to explain why it is where it is. Simply multiply the numbers shown to find its grid longitude to the west of the Great Pyramid. This meridian crosses right over its summit. And only about an inch from the grid longitude mandated by the code. As explained in my earlier presentations, the number 365 has no more meaning in the code than it does in referring to the calendar. There is no 365 day year and never has been. Today the year is 365.2422 days long and is growing. When this matrix was mapped out thousands of years ago, the year was 365.020081 days long, and that's the number we have to use here. It results in a slightly higher value for Kukulkan's grid longitude, and the very same number which fixes the grid longitude of Stonehenge. But, be that as it may, either figure, 52560 or 52562.8, keys the actual West Giza longitude of the Kukulkan. Here again, the monument shows us where it is on our maps. The same can be said of another pre-Hispanic monument, which shows an observer the number 365. This one is at El Tahin in Veracruz, the celebrated pyramid of the 365 niches, locally known as Los Niches. Its sides are decorated with small, square cubby holes, 365 of them. Again, they are thought to have had a ceremonial significance, one niche for each day of the year. Can Los Niches speak like Kukulkan did? Sixty steps climbing up its sixty-foot-high facade, six terraces, three hundred and sixty-five niches. Multiply them. Anyone care to guess the West Giza longitude of this pyramid? Then we have this one the so-called Pyramid of the Magicians at Uxmal in Mexico. The only round-cornered pyramid the Maya ever built. At least, it's the only one we've found to date. Can we figure out why? Yes, but not from this angle. It has to be done from above, looking down, in order that we may appreciate its base plan. A square with rounded corners. Go ahead, give it a try. I'm willing to bet a used pop bottle cap that some of you have a pretty good handle on it already. Do we not see rounded corners, which suggest a circle? Do we not also see straight sides, as in a square? Does it therefore not suggest that we square the circle? What happens when we square the common 360 degree circle? We find 129,600, which encodes the West Giza longitude of the Pyramid of the Magicians. 120 degrees, 54 minutes, 20 seconds. Not so difficult. So our dim-witted progenitors were quite adept with math and maps. They could accurately plot longitudes anywhere on Earth. And latitudes. And they spared no effort to leave this message for us. And they left it everywhere. So we wouldn't miss it. And for centuries now, we intelligent modern people 
have been looking at these monuments, scratching our heads over who built them and how, violating them in an endless search for gold, jewels, and bones. Even restoring them for the tourist trade. We've written reams upon reams of analysis explaining their purpose while standing on them or in them, completely unable to see them for what they are. Time capsules from great teachers. Those monuments serve to introduce us, to alert us, to the presence of knowledge in remote antiquity, and they did so by showing us simple numbers and geometric constants. The use of the pi ratio wasn't once involved, but that was level one of their matrix. Now we go to the next level. Out at the Cahokia site in Illinois, the largest mound complex in all of North America, the ancient builders once raised what we loosely call a Woodhenge. Located some 3,000 feet to the west of Monk's Mound, Woodhenge consisted of huge logs some two feet in diameter, all raised and stood on end. In all, the builders placed a total of 48 of these hernia-sized logs in a circle 410 feet in diameter, or about four times wider than England's Stonehenge. While they may have preferred logs at Cahokia, over the 20-ton stone blocks used at Stonehenge, be assured you have not suffered true fatigue until you've tried to shoulder a log two feet in diameter and 20 to 30 feet long. They take five men and a dog just to roll, let alone lift. Anyway, someone, Hopewells or whomever, somehow managed to manhandle 48 of these logs into an impressive circle. Why 48? 48 posts, a 360 degree circle, yeah, they knew degrees, and pi. And we find that figure which actually shows us Woodhenge's latitude north of the equator. Now, if we do not use the pi ratio against Woodhenge's 48 posts, we wind up too far to the south, well clear of everything, barely on the fringe of Cahokia itself. But add in pi, and our parallel crosses right over the center of Woodhenge. And that's why the 48 posts were necessary in the Woodhenge, to show us where it is. Another circular monument whose position was oriented to both its form and the pi ratio is England's Silbury Mound, or Silbury Hill, the largest man-made mound in Europe. 550 feet in diameter at the base, 131 feet high, and presenting a consistent slope angle of 30 degrees. But rather than being a true cone, the builders gave it a flat top, a round flat top. I like it when they do that. It simplifies things. Let's see now. Two circles, one at the base, the other at the top. That's two 360-degree circles or 720 degrees. Consistent slope angle of 30 degrees. 
and pi. The parallel of latitude drawn at precisely 51 degrees 24 minutes and 55.43 seconds crosses right over the center of Silbury. Again, the pi ratio was required in addition to its visual message. Code buffs will recognize this figure, 67858.4, which encodes the latitude of Silbury because they've seen it before. It was also used to position the large Kefren Pyramid at Giza. The British have been looking at the Silbury a lot longer than we Americans have been looking at our mounds. Why have they not explained Silbury by now? Why did this colonial have to do it? I'd much rather go fishing. They seem content only to measure it, or dig holes in it in a search for whatever. Well, listen up, blokes. Dig all you want, because you won't find anything in it. Silbury falls under the category of a significant mound. What does that mean? As we already know, Silbury is the largest mound anywhere in Europe. Significant. Let me show you what that means to the global matrix system. When we divide Silbury's grid latitude by its grid longitude, we get the value of its coordinate intersect, or CI. As members of a largely literary culture, most people today are not comfortable trying to memorize long numbers, especially irrational numbers. So let's apply some algebraic law and give this value the letters SCI for Silbury's coordinate intersect. SCI, 720 degrees and 30 degrees. The product shows a number which encodes still another set of coordinates, which are easily memorized. 38, 39, 37, almost poetic. Thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-seven point fourteen. There they are again, on Monk's Mound at Cahokia, Illinois, North America's largest mound. Speaking directly to Europe's largest mound, or vice versa. Significant to significant. Another level of the matrix I shall get into later on. We haven't found anything in Monk's Mound. So you shall find nothing in the Silbury. Something else I should point out while we are back here at Cahokia. Count up all the 90 degree corner angles on this uh, archaeologically restored model of Monk's Mound. If you counted 20, you are correct. In the language of the code, that becomes 20 pi. Notice also that it has four terraces. That's four pi. Multiplied, 20 pi and 4 pi become 789.568, or 789 and a half. I am assured by the Illinois State Museum at Springfield that the original width of Monk's Mound was 790 feet, plus or minus 12 inches. Monk's shows us its original measurements. Who needs rulers? Thank you, Silbury. No, it isn't Silbury again, though there is some resemblance, but only from this angle. Flat topped, 30 degree slope. The difference is that this mound is in Mexico at a place called La Venta. There's another difference, too. It isn't a circle and never was. It is a series of ridges and gullies which radiate downward from the flattened summit. In all, ten of each. 
and it has been verified. The gullies were deliberately made. They are not the result of natural erosion. Ten ridges, ten gullies, thirty degree slope. And, of course, the pi ratio and presto. It's latitude north of the equator. Notice something else here, namely the small ramp that extends off toward the northwest on an azimuth of 343.7 degrees. Those numbers link to the code because 343.77 just happens to be exactly 6 radian. Anyway, this azimuth, when given to the 10 ridges and 10 gullies of the Leventa Pyramid, eagerly provide us with this monument's longitude to the west of the Great Pyramid. Its CI, or grid point, then, has a value of 36.475626. How does it speak to the glow matrix? When we take the time to multiply it by the grid latitude of Stonehenge, 21,600 as shown earlier, it becomes the volume of the 360-degree sphere. 787, 873.524 cubic degrees. For any who might like to check it, the formula is in red at the bottom. The value for R is the radian from the 360-degree circle. They explained all of this at the Quiquilco Pyramid, which I presented in my earlier release, the code 1994. If Leventa's data comes as a shock to some, history does insist that these pre-Hispanics were ignorant, then prepare for another. The ancient Babylonians are generally credited for having spelled out the first mathematics and the Greeks are believed to have put the polish on it somewhere between 500 B.C. and the time of Christ. America's La Venta Pyramid has been formerly dated to 500 B.C., which means it is most likely much older. Pi, in use in the West, before the time of the Greeks. Sorry, history. These pre-Hispanic deities were mathematical. La Venta is the only surviving mound here, there was once a lot of others, which could be easily seen from its summit. Unfortunately, they went down to our god, oil. Our next pie-oriented mound is in Georgia. It goes by the name Etowa. The Etowah is a mound of respectable size, 333 by 380 feet at the base, and is exceeded in its proportions by very few other North American mounds, such as the 1,037-foot-long Monk's Mound, 670-foot-long Emerald Mound, and Eastern New York's 800-foot-long Hoosick Mound. It is about 70 feet high. Four squared corners at the base, four pi, two ramps, two pi, and 90 degree corners everywhere. 90. And voila, that was latitude and the code value which encodes it. A word of caution if you visit the Etowa site. Stay on the paths. Do not wander off into grassy areas. The rattlesnakes are everywhere. And speaking of snakes, guess what happens when we divide Etowa's grid latitude of 7106.11 by 5? We are left with exactly 1421.223, the number which encodes the latitude of Ohio's Serpent Mound. And notice, please, that it has five coils. 
Now that we have all had our basic training on observations and the use of pi in finding things, we're ready for some graduate work. For this, we return to Guatemala, to a place called Tikal. The subject of this segment is Temple One, the so-called Temple of the Giant Jaguar. A magnificent pyramid that was built, apparently, by the Maya about 2,000 years ago. Much taller than it is wide, Temple One is 154 feet high. but only 128 feet wide. And would you look at all the numbers it shows. Well, it looks like we shall be here for a while. I discussed this, the peripheral pyramid's position in the matrix in my previous video entitled Matrix West, but I did not explain how to find its position in the grid. That time has now come. With so many of them in evidence, the emphasis here is obviously on the 90 degree corner angle, of which there are many. And when the ancient architect goes to such extremes in order to show them to us, it's best that we pay very close attention. Notice the indentations at the corners of this Temple One's bottom terrace. In all, there are 24 such 90 degree corners at ground level and 24 more on top of the terrace. That's 48 on each terrace. Then they stacked eight more of them on top of it for a total of nine terraces. As such, they gave this pyramid a grand total of 432 of these 90 degree corners. Four thirty two by ninety makes Temple One's corners worth thirty eight thousand eight hundred and eighty. Okay, what's the next most obvious number shown by the architect? The staircase, of course, and one staircase on nine terraces equals ten facial features, very obvious facial features. Factor that into our formula, and then apply the pi ratio. Which encodes Temple One's longitude to the west of Giza's Great Pyramid. It answers only to pi, hence becomes another pi pyramid. I went on to explain why Temple One should be called the Peripheral Pyramid, because unlike Tikal's other pyramids, this one faces west. To answer the Great Pyramid's prime meridian, the long way around the Earth, two hundred and thirty-nine degrees fourteen minutes and thirty-six point nine eight seconds to its east, and keeps its back to the east, thereby being west of the Great Pyramid by 120 degrees, 45 minutes, 22.91 seconds. Both answer the very same figure for its grid longitude. And we like to think of these ancient builders as primitive and without knowledge, stupid sun worshippers? There, history, ethnology, Anthropology? Archaeology? Checkmate. Let's see you get out of that one. You've been looking for our roots. Behold, here they are. They're time capsules just boiling over with easily decipherable information. We don't have to dig for the answers. They're right out there in the open for all to see. So very simple.
When I began searching for the answers as to why the world's pyramids are where they are back in the early 1980s, metrology was the last thing in my mind. The reason for that came from my having read well into the subject over previous years and found ancient metrology to be a hopeless shambles of disorder. The Hebrew cubit over time varied from as little as 16 of our modern inches to as many as 25.2 inches. Egyptian cubits varied from 17.7 to 20.67 inches. The Roman cubit was 20.76 inches. Babylonian cubit 20.88. Zimbabwe cubit 20.64 and so on. No common ground between any and no constants. I let it go after reading a conclusion by General Sir Charles Warren that the geometric standards of measure in use amongst the ancients were nearly identical with those of the present day. Yeah, right, I reasoned. If the earliest written records show this much confusion in metrology, we will never find the original base. It's gone. But as my own search of the pyramid code system advanced, I began finding clear references to our own English 12-inch foot and 5,280-foot mile, and time after time after time. It didn't make any sense, because the British didn't legalize our 5,280-foot statute mile until 1593 A.D., and all the pyramids were built before that. So what was I seeing here? Had archaeocryptography found the original metrology? Here, atop Tikal's peripheral pyramid, the 24.9015 foot depth of the temple shows a perfect numerical match to the Earth's 24,901.5 mile equatorial circumference. A clear reference to the modern 5280 foot mile. Next, and also presented earlier, is the message from Temple 2 here at Tikal. Its message was encoded in its stairway. Fifty-nine steps, divided into two separate staircases. The visual message is obvious. Divide fifty-nine by two, which results in twenty-nine point five, or twenty-nine and a half. The width of the staircase at ground level is 29.5 feet. No, no, some will argue, that refers to the 29.5 day lunar cycle. Well, that's no argument because its width is still 29.5 feet, and the builders of Temple 2 went to a lot of trouble to show us 59 numbers divided by 2. Call it the lunar cycle if you wish, but it's still 29.5 feet. And what could be clearer than the 60 steps which climb the facade of 60 foot high lost niches at El Tahin? The 12 inch foot again. One step for every foot. Then we have Temple 4 at Tikal, with its 15.49 foot high terraces, answering the 15.49 degree azimuth of everything at Teotihuacan and at 72.6 degree slope angle. 72.66 is the square root of 5,280, the foot and the mile. Then too, we have its West Giza longitude of 120 degrees, 45 minutes, 48.669344411 seconds. The final aspect echoing precisely the 48.669344411 foot radius of far off Stonehenge. And let's not forget how the grid latitude of the Sun Pyramid at Teotihuacan, when divided by pi, comes back at 7441.506402 feet, the exact area of Stonehenge, in terms of 12 inch feet. Then divide that result by the 15.4919 degree azimuth of Teotihuacan and wind up with 480 
0.3471728 feet, the original height of the Great Pyramid. Feet again. Next we have Poverty Point's huge earthen concentrics, which have shown us a figure for its diameter at 3,950 feet. One foot for every mile of the Earth's polar radius. Foot and mile both. But it's no real problem for a master suppressionist to dispose of any of the preceding by simply asserting that all of these field measurements are wrong. So let's set up another checkmate, shall we? Kukulkan does this for us, in part. 90 degree right angles everywhere. And it's 365 steps, which we now know to represent the figure 365.020081. The derivative here is 4.055778, a figure which any better modern calculator can show as being the tangent of 7123.85068. Kukulkan explained the first part. Back in 1993, the U.S. Geological Survey explained the second part. I sent the exact coordinates of Kukulkan and the Great Pyramid off to the National Geodetic Survey in Silver Spring, Maryland, and asked their computers to plot me the exact surface distance over the Earth which separates these two pyramids. I further asked that they provide the figure back to me in terms of 5,280-foot statute miles. And this is how it came back, 7,123.8. This 7,123.8 mile line from the Kukulkan vectors itself on the Great Pyramid, or vice versa. The tangent to mile message here is so obvious that no further explanation is really necessary. And that's only the beginning. For the terminally skeptical, I would like to add the following. This tangent from the Kukulkan was also utilized as a square root. You see, its square is 16.44934. And that is what the eye on the human face at Poverty Point sees when it looks at Florida's huge panther mound, 806.52 statute miles away, wearing a tangent of 16.44934. So put all the cubits, kilometers, and Roman miles away. They are clearly degenerated from an original foot-mile metrology that antedates everything we've ever found in the written record for ancient metrology. Remember, it doesn't take too much to change any metrological unit. The crooks and the mighty have been doing so since as far back as the written record is able to reach. Whatever best serves an existing system will be activated, and one doesn't have to read very far into ancient metrology to see it. It's recorded as far back as the time of Solon, circa 550 BC. It was he who, for political reasons, tried to impose a system of measures based upon the sextarial system. But the people liked the system they were using. It was working. The battle continued for a few hundred years after Solon went into transition. But the establishment ultimately won when drastic steps were taken to completely eliminate the existing metrological system from the memory of the people. It's been going on ever since and shows no sign of letting up. It's just a matter of time before the foolish metric system is force-fed to the lot of us and the foot and mile will disappear. And Mallor's measurement for Temple 1 will be the only one permitted, 759 centimeters. Temple 1 will go silent again. 
and the steps on Temple 2 will refer only to the moon. Regrettably, there are those who would dearly love that. Keep the secrets of the pyramids shrouded in mystery. Let no one know truth. So, best we find out what we can, while we can. As for Pi, well, they won't be able to dispose of that by passing a wall. Pi, the key to a higher level in the matrix. Yet, how are we to distinguish between the rational pyramid and the irrational Pi pyramid? Do we look for summits that were built off center? Mounds of unusual shape? like this cross mound at Tarleton, Ohio. An abundance of right angles in a ground plan. Certain effigy mounds. Wildly corrupted designs. It requires a well-trained eye, but for they who haven't figured it out, there is another way, a much more difficult way. Dig them, gut them, and when they refuse to give up any human bones, well, the odds are that's a pie monument, excluding, of course, intrusive burials. The Serpent Mound is a good example. Nothing there, just dirt. How do we know it's a pie monument? Because of its grid latitude, 1421.223. It's one of those constants they used, but which we have never heard of. A pie multiplex. But how is one to glean such a pie multiplex from this mound? After all, it has no terraces, no 90-degree corners, no stairs, no temples, no on-site clues. We cannot see pie here because we weren't supposed to. The serpent belongs to still another level of the code. In that level, one must be in possession of Giza data. For example, the Micarinus Pyramid. It was originally 226.194 feet high, that figure being best remembered as 72 pi. The Egyptologists don't know it yet, and I dare say they will not care to, but the Micarinus was a true miniature of the Great Pyramid another 3D model of pi and double pi, which means that when we multiply at 72 pi height by double pi, it will become the length of its perimeter baseline. 1,421.223 feet. 12 inch feet. But the grid latitude of the serpent mound shows the same thing the 12 inch foot once again being transferred outward into the global grid system itself we have much to learn at Giza and we should learn it because the ancients knew it and we don't want them being smarter than us for example notice the longitude of the central Kefren pyramid 11.77245 seconds to the west of the Great Pyramid. That figure was known all over the ancient world. They even left us the proof. For example, it was the reason why Stonehenge and the Serpent Mound are where they are, separated by 3,865.14 statute miles. The tangent of which is Kefren's longitude.
So don't mess with the snakes. And let's try to protect this one, despite the fact that those charged with its care have recently lost their funding. England protects Stonehenge as a national treasure. It is only fitting that we do as much for Ohio Serpent Mound, indeed all of the aboriginal monuments which were bequeathed to us by the primitives, who, as it turns out, were better advised in a number of high sciences than we are. Pi, cryptography, metrology, tangents keyed to distances, and state-of-the-art global positioning. Clearly, this long-lost culture placed more value on knowledge than life itself, and they went to absolute extremes to ensure that those of the future, maybe us, would find our rightful inheritance. The choice is ours. We can ignore it and stay where we are, or learn from it. The pyramids are ours once again. Until next time then, I thank you.